Yeah, so the the book, a uh, little backstory. Let's start here. First off, growing up as a kid, going through school, I hated it. I was the what they call the just enough student. Uh, as you can see by the thing behind me, I was more into sports than I was into anything else. Uh, so getting out of high school for me was like, when I did it and I graduated at the time, it was the best achievement ever because whew, that chapter's over. And I already knew before my, my junior year started that I was not going to college. That, that was not an option. Continuing education, no way, not for me. Unfortunately, that left me with only a handful of choices. My parents weren't going to let me just stay at home and kind of mooch off of them and, and live, you know, kind of quote unquote rent free. Uh, so I either was going out on my own or I saw that as my, my opportunity to kind of do the next thing as a, as a man, join the military. Uh, and I said, that's it. I'm gonna, if I'm going to go that route, I'm going the Marine Corps version. And I'm going, the, what they say is the hardest of the hard. Yeah, I'm, I'm going there. So yeah, all in on that one. Yeah. Take all of that. And, you know, over the course of, of 10 years, it really was actually supposed to just be a four year uh, period of my life. Go in, do it for four years, come back out, uh, go into the construction field, which is what I had grown up working in and helping in. And well, four years after I got in, that's when we're right in the thick of the Iraq war and the Iraq conflict. And uh, if anybody, you know, on here or watching this later on the replay remembers that 2004, 2005 window, the economy was starting its, its drop, right? We weren't in its big crash yet, but there was some signs that something wasn't going to hang on very well. Uh, so the guy that I was going to go work for basically said, no, you can't come back. I can't hire you. I said, okay, I'm going to reenlist. Yeah. So I, that, that four year window turned to 10 years. Uh, multiple, you know, deployments. I've been all over the world, all over the globe with it, got out. And I knew one thing at that 10 year mark, they say that that's like the hump. You either stick and go the rest of the way or get out and go. And for me, it was, I didn't want it anymore. I wasn't having fun. I was picking up rank and I was being put into positions that weren't what I kind of visioned myself doing when I enlisted. Basically, I was being taken away from the field, wasn't allowed to be with my guys anymore. I had to get into more senior leadership roles. Uh, the adrenaline of being out on the missions weren't there. So for me, it was that was my sign. I got to get out. And I talk a little bit deeper about the story in the book, where it all happened, sitting at my grandparents' uh, table at Christmas, realizing what was really happening in my life. I was at the lowest of low at that point. I, I, I wasn't suicidal but I was in a kind of period of time where I really didn't care what happened to me. So I threw away a 10 year career, got out, moved from, I was out here in California at the time, moved back to Northeast Ohio, no clue what I was going to do, no job lined up, enough money in a bank account to make it a couple months. It to sounds like giant, right now, it sounds like this pandemic situation for people right now, right? Like what? Yeah, that was a, a self-inflicted <laughs> moment, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, an outside circumstance that's got us in this position, but it's basically what a lot of people are feeling right now, this pressure of no work, money that can get me to a certain end point, and that's about it. I'd thrown myself into that, and then you throw on top of that an Italian family that pretty much looked at me and said, you're an idiot. Like, I don't know what you're doing, but that is a dumb move. And all I knew was I didn't want to work for anybody else. And I was just jumping into this entrepreneurial role. I had no clue what that looked like. A couple businesses failed right out of the gate until I finally got my feet underneath me. Fast forward through, that was 2011. Fast forward into 2017. A lot of businesses happen really well. I'm traveling the country, speaking, doing a lot of education for business owners in the real estate niche where I kind of cut my teeth in the business world, so to say. And somebody came up to me one day after hearing my story from a stage and said, you have got to write a book. And I started laughing. <laughs> I'm the kid that didn't like high school. I'm the one that plagiarized every one of my English papers. Uh, and at the time, it was harder to plagiarize because you had to use the typewriter. So you actually had to read and type what it said, but try to change just enough. 
But that's how I got through school. So this, this concept of writing a book, I pretty much left. Roll into 2018, I meet a gentleman at another event that I'm at who's a publisher and a publishing coach. And he's like, I can work with you. I can help you. We can get you published. The whole, I'm, I'm laughing like crazy at all of this. <laughs> so finally, I said, you know what? Screw it. Everybody keeps telling me I need to do this, publish a book. I'm going to go for it. And I'm going to see what, what it kind of what happens with it. And even the book process of getting this thing to where it is today, you know, copies all over the, the globe right now. That was a, it took me using my own techniques and tactics on my own self to get the book to the finish line. Because there was periods of it where I felt like I was failing in the process. Yeah. I would start to write and then I would put it off to the, to the side and a month, two months would go down the line. I'd get on the call with my coach and he's like, what are you doing? Why aren't you finishing this thing? And I'm like, eh, I don't, right? The writer's block, the, the just loss of interest in it. And it finally took my girlfriend actually uh, about this time last year, because uh, we're rolling up on one year since the actual publishing happened. Uh, this time last year, she's like, when are you going to get that thing finished? Yeah. And it was kind of one of those shut up or do it moments that I talk about quite a bit that for some reason, Deanna seems to be the one to always hit me with. I say it all the time to my clients, people I work with. I talk about <laughs> it in the book and I get thrown at it all the time from, from her. Uh, and that's kind of where it all came from. Now, the concept of fortifying your mind, the tactics, when I really sat back and looked at my story, who I am, how did I get from this kid that care, could, didn't even care if he got a D as long as he graduated to somebody now who is all about results and all about achievement and really just goes after anything that he wants to get. It was the time during the Marine Corps. It was my time during deployments. It was the stuff that we used every day that I had no clue when I got out of the Marine Corps that I was still using every single day to get through this whirlwind of emotional kind of roller coaster, so to say, getting into business for the first time, stepping into it in 2011 when the economy still wasn't rebounded just yet, right? And all of this stuff, yet it was these tactics and it was kind of this playbook, so to say, that, uh, that got me there. So when I started to sit down and write the book, I didn't want to just tell my story. I wanted to kind of like you talk about all the time with your clients, I wanted to give somebody something that they could not just read and be like, wow, that was a good read and it was pretty cool, but give them something that they can read and immediately apply and yeah. make something happen for themselves out of. Yeah. Cause I'm loving your book too, because you're asking me to do stuff. Like when I read a chapter, I got to write things down. I got to think. And I got to think introspectively and honestly and transparently with myself. I got to confront myself and look at any gaps. And also I love um, the part you have in the book about there is always, it's like a silver lining. There's a gift in the failure. There's a gift in the experience. You have these questions that you ask us to ask, you know, first, what did you learn? What did you learn from this experience? Because there's value in that. So the, 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 there is no failure to me anymore through my life experiences. You, you are eloquently stating what I have come to find. It, I'm building the quality of my character. That's my ultimate goal. And so anything I experience is helping me do that. So to grow through things rather than just go through them, to be changed. Because that's what I really love about your book and who you are and how you live. It's not just about reading this. It's not. It's about doing what it says, <laughs> having these conversations with yourself, right? Holding yourself yep. accountable, being honest with yourself. Where are you dropping the ball? What did you learn from dropping the ball? How will you play the game differently now? What will you do now that's different? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, something people have told me forever. I never really realized it about my own self. I don't wait to take action on things. I just do them. Uh, and, you know, there's some really good books out there that I've, I've enjoyed. I've got it out there in the other side of the office here. I've got an entire bookshelf full of them. Some of them are really good. They were just great reads. But what I've realized is when I've read something or I learned something and I immediately apply it, 
whether I know exactly what I'm doing with it, not how it's going to come out. It does, that part doesn't matter. It's about just taking the action. And that's how you take a quote unquote failure that many people would fall into and be like, ah, I, I, I'm too afraid to do it because I'm going to fail. For me, I look at it like how fast can I fail? How fast can I screw up the first 10 times so that I learn something from it to be able to make it the best that I can absolutely make it. And that's the, the premise. And it kind of goes to that quote that you were talking about from Winston Churchill. Failure is not failure. No. It's just the stepping stone that we take to get to success. And those that succeed are the ones that are able to shut down that thought of failure faster and get to the failure quicker. I think so too. And I think one of the things that can get in the way are these negative thoughts. Cause I really, I, I love your, um, your relationship with your negative thought persona, you know, because I, I had felt it myself after September 11th, I had had a very successful business for 12 years. It was on a growth spiral that was not ending. It just kept getting bigger and bigger I was totally had my life uh, surrounded and obsessed uh, with it, with that whole experience. And then September 11th, shut it down. And mm -hmm. then the whole business landscape changed. You know, it was jewelry. So it was made in overseas. So even after September 11th, the whole industry changed. So it wasn't just that big event to take me down, but it was also the aftermath evolved into a whole new landscape where, you know, all the prices were cut and manufacturing overseas and, you know, accounts were no longer buying from locally made people because of bottom line money issues. So there are so many things to be displaced, right? And to be shocked. And so then what do you, what do you do now? And so there can be so much shame in that because you can beat yourself up. Like I, I should have known better or I, I should have, you know, done more due diligence or more research or found better mentors or asked more questions. You know, you can really, for a number of years, I really beat myself up. I took over responsibility for things that I had no control over. I had access to the tools I had access to the mentors I had access to. I, that I did the best with what I had at the time. Mm -hmm. And so to beat myself up for not knowing what I didn't know and not having what I didn't have, it really wasn't productive. It kept me in a state of shame. It kept me in a state of uh, frustration and depression. It kept me in a state of regret uh, because people haven't experienced you yet. I've had the great pleasure of being in retreats that you have led where you're sharing curriculum. And he has this great um, moment in, in one of his trainings of, you know, we're chained to the past. And if we're looking behind us, there's no way that we can see our path forward or even move forward because we're dragging all of this baggage around. And so I was in the same place you were in, like, what am I going to do now? Mm -hmm. What am I going to do now? What do I even want to do now? What do I know how to do now? <laughs> you know, like, where is my place in the world? Because it was different for me. I started my business when I was 19 in college. I never had a job. I, I had like little piddly jobs while I was in high school. And when I was in college, a little bit. And then I had my own business. I didn't know how to be corporate or work for other people. I had no, I felt like a space alien. And, and, and two, you know, that was a whole learning curve too, just to be in, again, these new environments, new challenges. How do we face this new stuff? How do we dive in? Like, I didn't know how to do this Facebook live thing. You coached me through that. I don't know what I'm doing here, right? But like, we have to take this step forward and trust, right? Our intention is good. We're here because we wanna encourage people that they're not alone in these overwhelming challenges and these cavalcades of emotions that we have to confront and all of these fearful and negative thoughts and all of this self-judgment that I was just speaking about. I had to dig through all this garbage. I, I, I describe it for myself. I, I went into this deep, dark hole and I was covered in all the dirt and I literally had to claw my way day by day out of this deep hole of all the self-judgment and the fear and the negativity and the overwhelm and the what am I gonna do now question. Because again, I like to take action too. 
And usually I know what I'm going to do and I'm just going to do it. And it actually makes me so frustrated when I'm not clear on what I want to do. That alone was making me crazy because I really didn't know for a while. Mm -hmm. In transition, in these big life transitions, I really, for the first time in a long time, I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. And that just was driving me crazy and drove me into this kind of personal development because we have to wake up and get clear. We need some kind of life direction, but we can't even think if we're consumed with all of the depression and the fear and, and the negative uh, thoughts. And, and it would really took me a while to work through that. So share with everybody, what do you call that little negative voice in your mind? Because I, I love you. You gave it a name uh, that really, really hit my heart. Yeah, so I mean, before I even share the name, the reason I named it, I mean, everything that you just described, it is a, it is a thing. It is a person. It is, it is our upbringing that, that causes that. It's the people that we've surrounded ourselves with that brings that out, right? Uh, so my favorite thing in the world to do is to, to have something that I can talk to. I talk a lot about doing self-talk and how self-talk can really help. Well, that's to me, but there's this other person who's me in the shadows back here that I don't want that person creeping up here into the daylight. So for me, I named her and I put a her to it. It, it is a female in my mind uh, because I'm this, this me is the, the man of it and that's the female side. Uh, so I named her and I have this vision before I even tell you the name, here's what she looks like. Uh, no different than we teach in business. Gotta have the avatar, right? right. She's about 950 pounds. <laughs> like job of the hut. <laughs> she's, a, she's a country bumpkin that carries this ginormous like sequoia tree as a club. <laughs> and on her side, she doesn't just have a sidearm, she has a bazooka. And her name is Bazooka Betty. Because when she does come up to me, and when she finally gets close enough to make any damage, in, in this case, get those negative thoughts going to where... I don't know what to do. I'm just going to fail at everything. Uh, this, that's it. This, the world's coming to an end. Yeah. And I, it, there's half of what's happening right now is out of our control. We, yeah. we physically cannot control it. Yeah. Yet Bazooka Betty, for me, that's her, she is adamant about telling us that it's your fault. Yeah. You caused exactly. this. You put yeah. yourself in it, right? So for me to shut her up, to be able to have the conversation with her, to get rid of her, I had to put a name to her and I had to put a face to her. And I know exactly who I'm talking to because if I'm going to go battle that, yeah. I want to know what I'm up against. Yeah. And I'm up against a 950 pound, just huge country girl with a sequoia tree as a club and a bazooka as her sidearm. <laughs> I love Bazooka that. Betty. Bazooka Betty. Because we all, we all face that. We all face that. You inspired me to name mine Nuclear Negative Nancy. Because, you know, for, for, for me, I found this implosion mechanism that happens. Because if I, if I lose my love, if I lose my purpose, I have no gasoline. I just completely implode. I turn to dust. Mm -hmm. And so it's more of like a, like a, like a cellular level, like deepest part of me, like the nuclear Nancy just starts boiling up, starting to explode. And then just like the nuclear bomb, it starts to bleed out from, from my soul, from my heart and start to give that fallout into every area of my life. Cause it starts to pollute the way that you can show up in the world. It mm -hmm. starts to pollute the way you show up for yourself and how you can show up in your relationships. And then of course, how you can show up in your work. And it, then it just that, that fallout, that darkness, it just blocks out the sun and you can't breathe. It's just all ash and destruction and just keeps moving out miles and miles and miles. And then the, the more that you, you let it expand, right? The more you keep letting it go, right? Cause you could have one bomb go off. Can you contain it? Oh no, let's just like, do a bunch of nukes now <laughs> right so we'll not right. just nuke we'll not just nuke the career like you're so lost and where do you belong and what are you gonna do 
let's let's set up another one. Now, now your financial resources are bleeding out. See, so that's going to limit your opportunities too. So you're screwed there too. Oh, but wait, no. Let's really go for the jugular. Let's attack your health now too. Oh, so now you've been sick and you've had this problem for so long and it's escalating, getting worse. Now you're never going to get better. So even if you could figure out what you wanted to do for a career, and even if you could cobble together some financial support for you to go in that direction, your health is never going to be able to carry you. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to be a burden on anybody that loves you. So, you know, I even went into this place. You just better, you got to cut off everybody because you're going to take them with you. You're going to be, I, I used to think of it as the Titanic. I'm going down. These people need to get on their lifeboats and get away from me. <laughs> I don't want to drag everybody into this big funnel here. You know, I'll sink by myself. Take the lifeboat get away from me. So, you know, when, when you go that, that deep with all of these areas of your life in, in the negative zone, you can make some really um, decisions that take me, it took me 18 years to recover relationships with family members, finances, you know, I did a divorce, bankruptcy, like I just went full, full throttle, you know, down to just horrible health. Like, I don't know, I, I feel like I can be such an extremist. I just had to bottom out as low beyond I could possibly imagine. <laughs> Playing with, right, listening to this nuclear negative Nancy talk. I, I just really didn't have any idea how to uh, talk myself down, basically. I didn't, I didn't know how to confront this until I could get to this point of just complete destruction and then it's like, um, it's game over and I'm done with life or I have to find a way to go on, but I can't go on like this. It's just not possible. I, now I have, I have no choice but to find a way to claw my way out of the, the dark hole. So I, I don't want people to go through that. You know, I'm sure you'd like to save some people some of those years of uh, suffering too. Absolutely. You know, if, if we just would have, you know, fortified our minds, right? Uh, a, a bit sooner, I, I wouldn't have lost a number of years of my life in this whole uh, nuclear war zone that I experienced within my own self, you know, because it, it doesn't even matter what other people will say to you as encouragement. It, when, when you get so locked in, you can't even hear that. People can believe in you and they can want to give you opportunities and help you, but you can be so lost, right? So overwhelmed by this attack of this inner negative voice that you, you can't even take that encouragement or opportunity. You can't even accept it. You can't even take it in and feel it, which is one thing I wanted to go into your book because one of the things I really loved is how in depth that you went into in your book. So for a number of years, many different training opportunities I've had books, what have you, we, we all talk about visualization and I, I've been a yoga instructor, meditation teacher since 2007. You know, we do guided imagery meditation, for example, right? But it wasn't until I went into graduate school for acupuncture, one of my favorite teachers, Michael Redman, he told us day one, you have to make this material mean something to you. It has to solicit emotion or you're never going to remember it. You're never going to care. And that really had a profound effect on me because if I can associate medical education, material diseases with a person that I care about. So then I started to diagnose everyone I ever met and my family. Like I had to put a face on these conditions of someone I cared about to solicit the emotion. I'll never forget this material now. So it's like this bazooka Betty. It's like my nuclear negative Nancy. I see you. I know who you are. I will never forget you. And then now, it, now you're, you're, you're a part of me. I know how to deal with you now, right? It makes such an impression because you, you went into, I've, I've, I've had it taught to me and read many books about visualization and how powerful that is. And we hear that athletes will do that, right? Visualize playing the game. And you as an athlete, you talk about the power of that too, that you've done yourself but I've never had it so eloquently explain the importance of making sure 
that it solicits emotion in you and mm -hmm. that it's the power of the emotion that you feel that creates the power of the visualization to manifest in your life. I just think that's so important and so uh, profound. And you said it so well in your book. And I really want that point to be made for people. Yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at it, the reason the emotion is so important for anybody can sit there and visualize whatever they want to visualize. And we hear this a lot, uh, especially in the personal development field. You got to visualize it, visualize it. If you yeah. just visualize it, it'll manifest itself. Yeah, why not? It's the secret, blah, 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 right? That's yeah. all you need. And it's, you know, yes, there's some power to it, but where the power of visualization really comes in is when you get yourself, I, I walk through the example in the book of using the apple, spinning the apple, being able to like a, a camera in a sense, zoom so into it where you're so crystal clear on what you're looking at that you can see the texture of the skin, right? All of these things, they're creating emotions inside of us. And the reason our visualization has to create emotion is without emotion, action never comes. Right, you'll never People have People will guess. move for pain. They will do anything to get away from pain. So when you're visualizing something and you can see the negative aspect of it, you can see and feel, and I talk about it even as a, as a triathlete, you know, the physical pain that my body was about to go through, visualizing the race the night before the race, it put me in a position that when I even started to feel some of that pain coming in during the actual race, I'd already experienced it in my visualization exercise that I knew exactly what I needed to do to stop it. I could feel that that was creeping in and it's time for nutrition, it's time for salt, yeah. it's time to slow back the pain, whatever it is, right? because we've already been in that pain and we don't want to go back to it. We don't want that negative aspect. So if there's a point that anybody can ever remember when you're doing visualization is create emotion out of it because without emotion, action won't happen. People don't do anything for pleasure. They will do everything for pain to you get rid of it, to stop, to stop it, pain. to avoid it. Yeah. You will move hell and earth simultaneously to not have pain to defend. Look at what's going on right now with the, the coronavirus. Everybody's cooped up, cabin fever. There's, a, there's an emotional pain happening. People are doing anything to get away from that right now. You see people out walking that probably have never walked in you know, the last year. They've never gone on a walk around their neighborhood. They're, oh, yeah. they're doing, the, some of people are just doing things uh, in their homes just to get away from the, the mindset. Why? Because it's painful to be cooped up inside that house. It's yeah, you painful have to, to be not engaged. be engaged. To... You have to be occupied or you're going to really literally go crazy. Yeah. Right. So they're doing anything that they could possibly do to get away from it. Well, when we take that into the sense of, of visualizing and I see some of these things happening and, and I visualize pretty much daily, right? there's, there's always something going on and I visualize What's the positive out of it? What's the negative out of it? Obviously, I, I want to create more emotion out of the negative because that's going to fuel me in my action to create the positive result that I ultimately want from it. So create emotion so that you create action. But I love what you said about not being afraid because people get so caught up in, in only positive emotions, right? We want only positive emotion. We don't want to acknowledge the negative emotions and the dark places. And I like that you courageously confront that. And that's one of the things I love from the, the work of Byron Katie. You confront the painful thought mm -hmm. and you think about it from different perspectives. You challenge it. You challenge the thought, right? You, you, don't, you don't try to avoid going through the visualization of the challenges of the triathlon. You're being real about it. And then because you're being real about it, then, right, you decided, okay, so, right, I have this kind of nutrition. I'm probably going to need it at this point in time when I feel this way. Because I, I had done this with my acupuncture board exam. So I did this uh, four and a half month course. I studied four to eight hours a day, seven days a week. I took four hour uh, practice tests. I made myself into a machine of answering these electronic tests and questions. So that I got to the point where I exactly knew my pace. I had to take a break after every 40 questions or I would get burnt out. Because if we didn't take the break, we could see we would have this brain 
bomb out moment where I would miss questions that I totally knew the answer, but I just had brain fatigue. Mm -hmm. And then because I have orthopedic pain, I cannot sit in that practice test situation. They didn't allow a standing desk. They didn't allow anything that I would do with the computer in the testing center. They didn't even let me put my feet up. Like it was just, it was bad for me in that chair. So I knew, I knew you need to take, you're going to be angry. Things are going to start to hurt. You're going to need to move. Every 40 questions, you're going to get up because you were allowed to go to the bathroom and then you had this locker where you could get a snack from. And they were like watching you because they don't want you to cheat, right? Mm -hmm. You had to do a fingerprint to get in and out of the room is this whole thing. And they must have been like, this girl has no bladder. She's like going, I was like, <laughs> it's not about the bathroom. I want to walk. I want to walk down the hallway. I want to go in the bathroom. I want to breathe. I want to have my snack. And so I was, you know, for, for brain function, right, we, we, we use a lot of fat and sugar in the brain. So my, my whole thing were these, I love these uh, Flex for Life uh, brownie bites. It's like a, like a healthy, right, brownie situation. Just healthy for me because I have issues, right, with grains to eat other stuff. But it was a hit for me. It was like drugs. I'm going to eat this awesome brownie. I'm going to get this big sugar spike. I'm going to walk. I'm going to move. My body's going to hurt less. And I'm going to go in and attack that next 40 questions. And so because of all of that prep, because I did the work at home, because I taught myself every day, I mimicked that test mm -hmm. every day. I made myself go through it. Even beyond visualizing it, I did it. I did it over and over and over and over again until at the point when I was taking the actual test, because I got so exhausted from that run. The training was so exhausting to me, but it was easy when I was in the room because of it. And, I, and at that point, I exhausted myself working so hard so much. I was so tired. I was so over it. I just wanted it to be over. <laughs> and that's, I mean, it's, what you're saying is so true no matter where it falls, right? Take, I've, I've done multiple Ironmans, half Ironmans, and we always used to say, like, the hardest part was the training. It yes. was a reward to get to race day. Yeah. Because, well, I only got to do this because I put in all of that work. Yes. It's built me up to that same point. Business. As a business owner, it's the same thing. If you're doing these things every single day, then when it comes time for it to actually happen, it's easy. And that's the point of fortifying our mind. If we're fortifying our mind every day, whatever challenge that comes is no big deal when Bazooka Betty shows up. You got this. You can laugh in her face because it's ridiculous that she's trying to mess with you now. And that's my whole goal about resiliency. I'm not, I'm not worried about what happens now. I already faced the worst challenges I ever faced with way less experience and tools, way, way less discipline. Mm -hmm. But again, it comes from doing the work every day because you, you just said you visualize every day. Every day. Not just sometimes, mm -hmm. not just a few times a month, not a couple times a year, not just for your birthday. Because that's the thing, it's, it's the training. Like I give myself acupuncture every day to refine and reset my nervous system because I can tend towards PTSD. I'm not gonna go back there. I refuse, so I got some better tools. There's absolutely no possible way that I can ever go into PTSD again. I got too many tools. <laughs> I'm, re I'm refining my nervous system. I got, I got, I got my needles in here right now. I'm not messing around. You're always, every time we talk, you always get needles somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so again, this is the point of, of sharing you with this group. And I love that you show up in life to share your experience and train people because you're living it. You're doing it. Cause that's really the point. We're not asking anyone to do anything we're not doing. This is the point. We, we need to choose our tools and we need to use them diligently every day. It's the only way that we will become resilient and able to face any challenge that comes in life. And there are many like this pandemic that we can't control. 
I couldn't control September 11th. I can't control this pandemic, right? We had SARS, we had the bird flu, we had Ebola, like this stuff happened, right? Mm -hmm. The economy happens, right? Like you had said, okay, so being in business, right? When the economy's down, it's an opportunity, isn't it? You're in real estate. The whole world is on sale for you now, right? Same thing when the stocks are down. Oh, well, now the sale prices are great, right? <laughs> so there's always a way to turn it around to look at these challenges as opportunities, right? What can we learn? So if, if I don't have the liquid cash to invest, can I learn what? That these cycles happen, right? If I, if I wasn't prepared to take advantage of it right now, I can be aware it's going to happen again. Maybe I can prepare for the next one. What can I learn from this one as it's before my eyes teaching me, right, mm -hmm. what the cycle is? So, you know, a lot of people, I think, too, I wanted to say this because we can feel like, oh, I missed the boat. I wasn't ready for this. You know, a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck. A lot of people have been overextended with credit. I myself, I had expanded into my own practice office last July. I made a huge investment in that, not just working for other clinics anymore. That was a big step. And so I, I don't have a lot of liquid savings resources. I invested a lot of stuff. This is not particularly good timing for me to take advantage, right, of these sale prices. I was like, oh, wow, you know, I could have really bought a lot of cool stuff. <laughs> right but I already in invested the, the resources I had in in my practice that now is mandatorily closed it's hysterical right <laughs> now my office is a place that I go to to take care of my plants and make videos it's a set it's like a playground right but that's I mean that brings up a, a really good point and, and let me just for a second here, put some clarity, right? The, the concept of fortifying your mind, it's, it's a combination of tactics. It's the tactics that we used in battle. It's the tactics that we use when planning any kind of a, a patrol or mission or anything like that. Uh, we've hit on a few of them here, but it's the, the first tactic is just about simplifying. And what you're talking about right now is just that. It is yes. this concept of simplification. Listen, it is what it is right now. You've got to simplify what you can do, what you can control, and execute on that. If you weren't ready for this, newsflash, nobody was. Yeah. The second portion of that newsflash, it's going to happen again. Yeah. I laugh when I hear people say something like, oh, well, when this is over and we're back to normal, that, that, what is normal? Yeah, exactly. Right? Normal is constantly evolving. Normal, you know, there is never going back. It will never be exactly the same, ever. So you've got to take this time to look at it and say, I've got to simplify down now. Right now, we've got to super simplify. And then as things start to evolve and change and we can kind of somewhat get to what we thought was normal, but it's still going to be different in the, in the future. Yes. Things are going to change. So I'm going to need to simplify some of the stuff to fit in that, that moment. Visualize. Tactic number two, we've been hitting on that like crazy. Now's the time to be visualizing the simplification yeah. of it. The other uh, two tactics behind that, they kind of play off of each other and go hand in hand, emotional control and non-reactive. Yeah. It's non-reactive is Bazooka Betty for me, right? That's where she falls into how we control that tech. I don't react to her. I see her coming. I know I can outrun her. I just take a whole lot more action and start making things happen. That's not reacting to the situation. Listen, we're all in this, this pandemic right now. We're all, we either got laid off or we've all got small businesses that are, you know, they're not closed. As, they're either closed or they're just not being able to do what they, they want to do. I was supposed to do a live event in a couple weeks here locally. Well, that's not going to happen. Well, I can't freak out about it. I can't react about it. And I can't let my emotions fly. And that's this idea of grabbing control of the emotions, grabbing control of the reactiveness, visualizing our way through it, simplifying the process to hold control of those. And then you sum it all up with the final tactic of have a pack of lions. Now I choose lions because I love the breed. I love that, that animal. I love what it stands for. I love it being the king of, of the jungle and nobody, nobody messes with a lion. 
when it's got its lions around it and its lionesses with it because they're just they're too tough. So you put we can't do all of these other tactics alone all yeah. the time. You've got to pull people in. You're one of my lionesses, MJ. I think that you had yesterday yeah. uh, on on and did some video with him. He's another one of our lions in yeah. there, right? Why? Because when I've got a bad day or a bad time or things aren't clicking, I got people I can reach out to to then help all those other tactics coming together and i wish i had my whiteboard because i could draw out with uh, maybe I'll, we'll do that on sunday so yeah, I can yeah. join in on sunday uh to see it but it's the, the whole thing of we're trying to get to a better future walking on this thing called life being chained to the present by this ball and weight that's holding us back here in the past and all we're doing is spending time looking here trying to get here and we have no idea where we're trying to go dragging all of this dead weight with us that that we are in control of whether we drag or not because that that's the whole thing we we are in complete control of our life experience from what we choose to focus on and that's what i love about your fortifying your mind tactics we we are in control we can have those conversations with ourselves we can change our focus in a new direction and as you had said i i had to learn the hard way i had to focus on what i can control Mm -hmm. So right now I can't focus on all of the investment I made in my practice and the funds that I don't have, right? What can I do? Actually, what can I control? And then one of the things too, I, I am highly motivated by purpose. We, we connect to our why. My why is to serve, to use my experience for, to make my pain have a purpose, to not have all I experience be in vain. To have it serve humanity, to not just be a whole bunch of suffering for nothing. So I was going to have this Sunday as a live event. I wanted us to be at the Alders Gay Retreat Center in the Palisades. I had made the reservation. I had to cancel it. This was not really my plan, but I I wanted to do this, talk to you today, have this event with you because I want us to serve people. Because this community you're describing of lions, we are stronger together and we can lift each other up. We cannot do this life alone. We will all face these hard days and these negative voices. And sometimes we need to turn to someone who is for real, who's been through it, to talk us about, talk us to get up again <laughs> mm -hmm. when we're tired from the mileage and, it, and we are dragging that ball and chain again. Because it's easy to pick it up at any moment. We can always go back into the past and load up that chain with several dead weight balls to start dragging them around. I love how you said you, you, uh, you decide to outrun your bazooka Betty by taking action. Because mm -hmm. again, within this landscape of being at home, this is what we can do. We can read great books like this and we can answer the questions you ask in the book we can do the work <laughs> we can use this time to face all these negative fears and thoughts and learn how to take action and out outrun them run beyond them i like to say I, I run through it i just because it's all smoke and mirrors really right so with the sheer force of us taking action the wind we create blows out all of the illusions and the smoke and mirrors of all this dust and fallout and destruction it's all bs it's really meaningless it doesn't matter we don't have to judge ourselves by it make up all these reasons you know like you said uh from the past your upbringing you know we all have these ideas right about what success is like what is your self esteem based on right so is it how much money you have in the bank or the car or the house you have or you know what or how popular you are there's all of these exterior ways we can measure success that's not simple is it mm -hmm. that's dependent on all these things we can't control so so now for me I, I measure my success how well did i show up for myself am i doing the work Nothing can make me feel bad. Nothing can take me away from my sense of my power, my own control over my life. I own it. I showed up for myself today. That's what I could do. 
I don't have anything to feel bad about. It's not based on any of these exterior things to have or anybody's opinion of me. I need to know I showed up for myself, then I'm bulletproof, right? 100%. I think you are so about that too. So I really am so grateful you could be here today. I know we're probably running out of time. I could talk to you all day long, every day. Uh, I, I want to, but that's, that's why people should come in on Sunday. Yes. Uh, some of this stuff. Uh, I, I know when I, I'll be talking deeper about, uh, some of these tactics, processes, that kind of stuff. Um, so thanks for having me on today. And I do, I look forward to Sunday yeah. and, uh, that, are, that are there. Yeah. So thank you so much, everybody. So there is always something that you can do. Sean Tiberio is a great lighthouse to shine the light on what it is that you can do to support yourself, to become stronger, and what is the action that you can take. And I'm so excited for you to see him on Sunday. You got a taste of his awesomeness today. And uh, we'll, we'll pick it up again soon. For sure. Thanks again. Thank you. You have a great day, Sean. Thanks so much for everything always. As well. All right. Bye-bye.